Um, good morning. My name is Darren, nursery manager at Chenards. We've a lot, some of you have been here before for some of these classes. Um, today we're talking about uh, Northwest natives, kind of an introductory level uh, to, to Northwest natives. We're going to focus on stuff that is available and fairly easy to use in home landscapes. And I'll get this running here. All right, so native plants for the Pacific Northwest, specifically for the Willamette Valley. When we run a class like this, it's always kind of good to start with the basics. And we're going to start off by talking about what really makes a plant native. Um, we like to say uh, native plants for the Willamette Valley are plants that were not originally introduced by man. Um, even that becomes kind of a question-begging term. Um, the issues uh, with, with introduction are more complex than that. The indigenous peoples did move some plant material around. So you can't necessarily not say not originally introduced by man when you're talking about thousands of years back. Uh, we like to say uh, plants that occurred within the specific region in question prior to European settlement is usually a pretty good uh, goal for our, for our regional natives. Um, native is fairly straightforward, but it gets in, you know, increasingly complex the more you want to define it. Um, things that are native to North America. Well, that's pretty broad and not necessarily relevant. Things that are native to the United States is just about as bad. Um, things that are native to Oregon is certainly better, um, but Oregon is a fairly diverse ecoregion encompassing alpine regions, Sea, seashores and coastal beaches, um, deserts, and high rainfall rainforests. So not necessarily, uh, necessarily native enough when we just talk about Oregon natives. So we like to get this down to at least a region. Um, and broadly what we'll be talking about today are plants that are native um, from the Washington border to the California border and west of the Cascades. Um, as good a slice as we can make on, on, on defining native to our region. You can play all kinds of games with uh, natives too in, in the sense of um, are they actually native if they are clones? So the issues with that, and I, I'll leave it to your own judgment uh, on, on how native you want to make your native plantings. Um, when you're talking about doing large-scale restoration projects or when you're talking about the broad availability of plants, it's definitely worth considering introdu introducing and planting seedlings. Uh, in other words, plants that were grown from seed to preserve the genetic diversity that's inherent in the species. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong with clones. Um, a native R is a clone of a native species. Um, but what happens if you find a really superior clone for any specific characteristic, for example, very floriferous or of a specific flower color, and then suddenly everybody is planting that for that species and complicated by the fact that it is a native species, thus can outbreed to the native populations in your area, you risk contaminating the gene pool or shrinking the gene pool by having a large introduction of one specific gene group. Um, that's not normally a huge problem until it is, when you suddenly get a pest or disease in that this clone is sensitive to. Um, if, if you've got most of your plants of that species in your area have genetics from that clone, they're likely to be susceptible to this disease or pest. Um, so when we're talking about doing larger scale rehabilitation projects, re reforestation, very important we use seedlings. When we're talking about in the home garden, again, I tend to leave it to your judgment. There are some great named varieties or clones um, of, the, of the native species, and they can be well worth using, um, but just bear in mind that you can affect the gene pool if you do that extensively and exclusively. It's um, worth noting at this point that a clonal selection is really different from a hybrid. Uh, a hybrid is where you cross two or more different species. 
you can have native hybrids, for example, manzanitas up on Mount Hood. There's several species in that region. They intercross and there are hybrids of them that grow out in the wild. Um, a clonal selection is you go out in the woods and you look at all these native plants and you find one that has characteristics you particularly like, either symmetry of shape, smaller stature, bigger size, specific flower colors, uh, very floriferous, um, maybe scented. And then you take cuttings of that plant and you propagate it clonally, you, keep, you clone it out. If it holds those characteristics and those characteristics are marketable, then you a clonal strain or native R is developed uh, that people then might, might, uh, might propagate out and, and sell. Um, so that's the difference between a hybrid and a clone of a native. So again, matters can be complicated or simple. Um, local sourcing does matter with natives. And again, this is more of an issue when you're talking about larger scale native plantings. We're talking about reforestation projects, re uh, restoration work, that kind of thing. You wanna make sure you're working with plant material that is as closely related to the plants in your already occurring in your region as possible. So from the same general region, uh, because those plants will be better adapted and Funny things happen sometimes in, in the plant world, uh, and including with native plants. One of the things that happens is, is regional minor variations can take on a whole new meaning when you talk about population level. Um, so for example, uh, checker mallows. Uh, there are checker mallows, uh, several species of checker mallow that occur in say the Portland area and along the gorge and the same species of checker mallows occur down around Eugene and they, and they bloom at different times. So what this means is your checker mallows, if you get your source material from Portland, you move it down to Eugene, you plant it down there, they may be blooming at a time when their species is not blooming, giving them problems getting pollinated, or when other species of checker mallows are being pollinated and thus in, in accidentally outcrossing. Um, so local sourcing matters. Uh, and when you're shopping uh, for native plants, it's worth talking with the period of people you're buying it from and understanding where that material is sourced from. For example, our native seeds and bulbs are all sourced from the Willamette Valley specifically, from usually um, Albany, uh, Eugene, or Salem areas. Um, and anybody who's selling you natives, specifically intentionally selling native plants, should have a pretty good idea of what their, what their sourcing is, because that is a relevant question in the natives. But when you're putting a few natives into your landscape, uh, I wouldn't panic as much about it. And if you're working with native Rs, that obviously isn't, isn't relevant either. So one of the things about working with natives, and there's some advantages, some disadvantages. One of the big advantages of working, worth working with natives is that they're really well adapted to the conditions you're likely to run into here. Um, as you might imagine, they occur wild here. Um, when we're looking at going through the plant lists, uh, it's good to understand what we're actually talking about when we talk about sun or shade or wet or dry. So we're going to go through a little bit of brief explanation of that. Um, sunny sites generally receive more than six hours of direct sun on the foliage of the plant um, during the growing season. This is not necessarily the case in winter on deciduous plants, though winter sun is relevant for evergreen plants. Sometimes we'll include uh, in sunny sites uh, locations that get at least four, but somewhat less than six hours if it's really, really intensely hot sun. For example, on a south facing between two large buildings, it's really, really hot. Plants that are being growing out there are going to need to be fully sun adapted, even though they're maybe not quite getting a full six hours of direct sun. Shaded sites are generally getting obviously less than six hours of direct sun. Um, this can be shadow pattern of structures, for example, uh, the same uh, example as above from the buildings around, or this can be the shadow cast by, by trees and other, uh, and other botany on the site. Um, when we say under six hours, we might also apply a shade designation to locations that are getting six or seven hours of sun, but it's mixed or filtered. Um, or is only very, very early in the morning, so it's not have any real intensity at all, um, that might also qualify as a shady site. So there's some judgment calls in here. When you, when you start playing with plant material broadly, we say, you know, we use full sun, partial, partial shade, partial sun, full shade, and we break them out a little further. Uh, but this gives you a pretty good idea when you're looking at native plants, what they're adapted to. And some will grow in just about any condition. Similarly, wet and dry sites are, are a significant consideration here. 
one of the great advantages to working with native plants is you can grow them in tough sites without spending a lot of time trying to fix the site, which you have to do with a lot of introduced plants. Wet sites might include um, consistently moist environments. For example, most of the Oregon coast is considered a wet location. They get a lot of humidity, a lot of moisture um, throughout the growing season and, and as well as through the winter. Um, wooded va river valleys tend to have a lot of humidity as well. Um, also in more open sites, wetland environments. Uh, for example, uh, we have a lot of wet prairie here on the valley floor, not as much as we used to, but it is being restored in a lot of locations. Um, so these are locations that can be very moist to actually seasonally flooded or partially underwater then in the winter. And in the summer, they can dry out to completely dry, but they're still effectively a wet wetland habitat because of the volume of moisture during parts of the season. Plants that are adapted to wet location, native plants that are adapted to wet locations, do well in irrigated landscapes. Um, and this is really commonly used uh, for home landscaping for that reason. Dry locations, on the other hand, um, are typically unirrigated uh, during the growing season. And so plants, uh, native plants that are adapted to dry sites often resent summer watering. Uh, they do not like to be watered in the summer even a little. Uh, some are pickier than others about that. We'll talk a little bit about that from plant by plant as we go through them. Dry sites can be the, just what you traditionally think of as a dry site. For example, a slopey, sunny location, um, an, an open meadow on, in, in the mountains, um, non-wetland non meadows but can also be shady sites uh, where there's a lot of root competition, uh, where the tree canopy blocks rainfall and the tree roots absorb a lot of the moisture, leaving very little available for smaller plants to take advantage of. So one of the things we like with working with native plants, one of the reasons we do like to integrate them into um, regular landscapes instead of just dedicated uh, native landscapes, is that they have uh, a real solid adaptability to some of our toughest sites. And we have a couple of particularly, uh, particularly difficult locations that we deal with in, in, in Western Oregon. We have a lot of wet clay soils. Um, wet clay soils are really challenging because they are saturated all winter long. Um, and they can dry out to the point where they have large soil cracks uh, in the summer. Um, they, they don't have any moisture at all until you get much deeper. Um, so this is very difficult for plants to adapt to because dryland plants that wouldn't mind the severe dehydration stress of the summer will drown in the winter or get root rot in the winter and wetland plants don't have that consistency of available moisture. Um, we have a, a number of these types of sites throughout the valley and of course we do have native plants that grow in them uh, and so there, there are options to work, to work with. Um, so typically in wet clay soils, you have to use plants that are well adapted, or you have to substantially change the soil, or you can take wetland plants, plant them into these wet clay soils, in summer irrigate them to make sure they don't get too dehydrated over the course of the summer. Another challenging site for landscaping is the competitive shade, the, the very dry shade environment that happens, for example, underneath the canopy of Douglas fir trees or under um, the native big leaf maples. Um, not a lot of plants grow in there. Even most ferns do not thrive in that dense of an environment. So typically you have to use plants that are both drought tolerant um, and shade tolerant. And that's a pretty small palette, but obviously we do have uh, plants uh, that grow in those environments na native here. One of the ways we deal with those sites is rather than trying to put lots of plants in, we put a selection of very well adapted plants that will kind of naturalize in and cover the space uh, and give you some, uh, some effect out there. Um, this includes a lot of our native bulbs and also uh, several colonizing ground covers that will kind of help fill in the spaces around the few larger shrubs that, that tolerate it. From there, we're going to talk about plants. I, um, be, in the interest of keeping this to a, a, a class that we can run in an hour, I'm not doing any big trees today because that's really not practical for most home gardeners in, in urban environments. So we're going to talk about some large shrubs to small tree categories in the shrubs. And we'll talk, uh, go through shrubs first and go through um, perennials and bulbs after and kind of give you an overview of some of the plants you might see that are native to, to the area. Um, when we made this selection criteria, we also tapered it down based on the concept of relatively easy to plant, grow, and relatively available for sale. Not all of our native uh, flora is, is consistently available for, for homeowners to buy. 
Some of our native plants are exceptionally picky and very hard to handle. A classic example of that is the native madrone. Uh, Arbutus uh, is, is almost impossible to transplant. It has a very low survival rate. Very few wholesale growers and very few retail nurseries will offer it for sale because of the very low survival rate. Um, so that we're not going to talk about that one because it's just too hard to work with. So shrubs, shrubs for uh, Western Oregon. California lilac is stretching the, the margin of being regional native. It occurs uh, in obviously wild in California up through Southern Oregon um, and occurs to um, its Northern extent in the Valley is not far South of Eugene where the transition happens from the more traditional um, damper west side environment where you start getting these drier hillsides more typical of the, of the California landscapes. Um, so it needs sharply draining soil, best in full sun, will tolerate a little shade, but really does like, like sun. California lilac is a first in species in disturbed soils in the wild. Um, so you will feel it, see it growing on rocky, uh, rocky hillsides adjacent to the road, for example. Um, it does nitrogen fix, so it's a soil improver and stabilizes soils very well, but it is relatively short lived, like a lot of first in species. Uh, 10 to 15 years is a fairly realistic lifespan. On the other hand, they tend to grow pretty fast, so still well worth uh, considering. California lilac is a pretty large shrub. It can be eight or 10 feet tall and as wide. They can be pruned, they actually make nice clipped hedges. You just, with that fast of a growth rate and the relatively coarse texture of the branches, it's a plant you need to keep on top of pruning rather than let it get big and then try to bring it back under control because chopping on them when they're very big is not very effective. They have blue flowers with a light scent and they're produced primarily in the spring, about mid spring and profuse. Um, uh, on, a, on a good year, the entire plant will be completely covered with these blue flowers. They often have a secondary bloom in the fall. That's not an uncommon uh, adaptation for plants from Mediterranean climates and they, they follow suit with that. They're fully evergreen. We don't have a lot of broadleaf evergreens uh, in Western Oregon and it's nice to see a few native ones like this. Ocean spray, Holodiscus discolor, is one of my all-time favorite shrubs and, and I think underutilized in home landscapes. We have a lot of sites where homes are developed into woodland environments and people are constantly trying to find a nice bigger screening shrub with some ornamental values uh, that, that will actually grow in that site and ocean spray definitely fits the bill. Ocean spray prefers dry environments, so it's at home in Douglas fir or oak woodland type situations and in part shade to shade. They'll, they'll make it to the edge of the woodland fairly frequently. They tend to burn if you try to keep them out in really full, full sun. They're a good screening shrub, but they are deciduous, so there's not the, the screen really isn't there in the winter, uh, but quite large, uh, 10 to 12, maybe 15 feet tall. I've seen them as big as 20 down along the road, so it's a fairly substantial shrub. Bloom time is early summer for whatever elevation they're at. For us here in the valley, that's June to early July um, at higher elevations, of course, later into the season. Those uh, creamy flowers um, that drape downward are well loved by a variety of pollinators, including a lot of our, our native bees. We have actually a batch of types of Oregon grape, three um, technically would, would qualify as native for our region. Mahonia repens, the smallest, is barely into our region, tends to be fairly alpine. Um, more commonly, you'll see these two, Mahonia aquifolium and Mahonia nervosa. Mahonia aquifolium is the traditional Oregon grape plant, a relatively upright plant with some tendency to colonize from the roots fully evergreen to six or seven, maybe as large as nine feet in a good site. The flowers are produced in spring. They're a nice bright cheery yellow and they are a key pollinator resource. That's one of the things that our migratory hummingbirds come back to enjoy. Um, you'll typically see the taller Oregon grape into sunnier locations, um, sun to part shade rather than dark um, and typically this means you'll find them in the woods on clearings or at higher elevations as, as, you, as you break out into the lesser tree cover. Berries are blue-black, um, are technically edible, but they are extraordinarily bitter, so they usually need to be combined with something else to make them uh, palatable. The indigenous peoples and the settlers did eat a fair amount of Oregon grape. Longleaf Oregon grape is the more common down here on the valley floor. And it typically likes moister sites, though it will adapt to reasonable dehydration, and shadier sites from partial shade to dense shade. 
It's still evergreen, uh, but the leaves are kind of dull rather than glossy, and it is a vigorous colonizer. It will form extensive um, mono monoculture uh, beds of itself uh, over time. Um, flowers are smaller than the tall Oregon grape, um, but still a good, a good yellow, still well loved by pollinizers. Nine bark. Uh, nine bark is named because of the peeling bark that comes off in layers, and uh, very it can be very attractive uh, when it's visible in the winter. Um, good pollinator plant again. Uh, white flowers from kind of a pale pink bud. Uh, after the flowers, they set a very dry seed capsule that a lot of small birds enjoy. Small birds also enjoy the native nine bark um, because of its dense branch habit, providing good cover and shelter for them. Uh, Pacific nine bark um, will tolerate a little bit of dehydration, but does best with summer irrigation. It's typically native along stream banks. Um, so while it's not uh, a typical floodplain, completely underwater species, it's really common in wetter soils along river edges and in low points. Um, Pacific nine bark will grow in sun or partial shade. Um, bloom time is usually about April to May here. Red flowering currant is one of our best known native shrubs and is widely planted all over the world because it is one of the showiest of our natives uh, that, that is out there. Another deciduous shrub and large, 10 or 12 feet. Um, they do their best in sun, they will tolerate some shade. They tend to like relatively dry environments, meaning not waterlogged. They do do okay with summer irrigation and will actually be denser and more floriferous with a little bit of occasional irrigation. Um, early spring bloomer, making it uh, usually a March bloom. Um, when, again, our migratory hummers, this is one of the key things they come back to find. The flowers are well loved by other pollinators, a number of native bees as, as well, some, some hoverflies and such as well. Berries that are set after flowering are uh, robin's egg dotted, uh, usually paler than, paler than blue, so kind of a grayish tone, very heavily speckled. Mealy and not particularly tasty, but not, not unedible, um, just not particularly desirable. Another plant that I feel is completely underutilized in landscapes here in the valley is Western Spirea. So this is a plant that if you walk out on the wetlands on either end of, of Corvallis and spend a little time out there, you'll find this is the dominant shrub in the landscape, um, coexisting with, the, with some of the large willows. This is a plant that can be actually underwater for fairly extensive periods of time in the, in the winter and can dry down to a cracking point uh, in the summer and still survive. It looks better if it gets some summer irrigation or is a location that holds some moisture through the summer. A tall shrub, and like a lot of wetland shrubs, uh, uh, something of a tendency to, to thicket or sucker out, so it does spread a little bit. The, the showy flowers are born over quite an extensive period of the summer, starting in June and going well into August. Uh, flowers are obviously well loved by pollinators, butterflies. It is a critical larval food source for some butterflies as well. And birds like it both as a cover species for shelter and for the small seeds behind the, behind the flowers. Indian plum is another favorite of mine, um, just from the association of, of, of living here and, spend, and spending my time growing up here in the valley. Indian plum is usually the first native shrub you see out under, in the understory of oak woodland or conifer woodland um, to bloom. Uh, the flowers are very early spring, usually about February. Um, we'll tolerate wet better than dry, but is adaptable across a wide range of moist, soil moisture types and doesn't like to be completely flooded. Definitely needs some shade. It will fry in a truly full sun environment. A relatively large shrub, often attaining small tree status, 10 to 12 feet. Uh, white flowers are hit by a number of pollinators, uh, again, primarily early, uh, early uh, native bees and, uh, and also some hoverflies because it is so early in the season. It is separate sexed male and female. If you have a, if you have a male plant out there, your females will produce small purple plums. It is in that, that, in that family, which are Again, technically edible, though not particularly palatable, but are well loved by a lot of wildlife. Snowberry. Snowberry is one of those fun ones because it doesn't matter if it's full sun, partial shade, or full shade. Um, as long as it doesn't get really completely dried out in the summer, or, or you can provide irrigation if it does, um, it, will, it will grow and thrive. Uh, it's a very tough and adaptable plant. 
a relatively small plant, um, about three to four feet, sometimes reaching as big as five feet, and very commonly encountered in, uh, in ditch, ditch lines um, or down in uh, the low elevations of ravines in wooded sites. The white berries are held well into the winter because frankly, there's not a lot of things that do eat them. Um, we do have a few birds and a few mammals that will eat them. Snowberry berries have a ton of saponins in them, uh, which makes them theoretically poisonous in practical terms. You can eat a few of them with no ill, Ill effects. Um, saponins will make you sick, but they won't kill you. They'll make you nauseous. Um, they can be cooked out if you get, if you get ambitious. So snowberry can be eaten cooked, but you shouldn't eat much of it fresh. Vaccinium ovatum is another well-known native shrub, the, the, the native evergreen huckleberry, one of several huckleberries native to our zone. Um, evergreen huckleberry, Vaccinium ovatum is the only one that really occurs from the coast to, to any substantial extent from the coast to the, uh, to the low slope cascades. Um, you'll see a little bit of red huckleberry here and there, which is a deciduous and much larger plant. Evergreen huckleberry is a particular note because as the name suggests, it is fully evergreen. The small, slightly, slightly toothed leaves are very attractive and glossy. It's not a very fast grower, but it can retain a decent size, four or five occasionally up as big as six feet. Um, we'll grow in sun with consistent irrigation or moisture available. We'll grow in partial or full shade, though they get kind of tall and stringy if they're really, really dark, but a very adaptable shrub. The berries are not bad, but not super, super tasty, but fully palatable. Um, indigenous peoples and settlers, again, again, ate a lot of them. The small bell-shaped flowers in the spring are visited by a number of native bees, and honeybees will make use of them as well. And we'll even see hummers on them, but they're pretty small for hummers to bother with. So that was a good cross-section of some of our, our more available native shrubs. Now we're going to talk a bit about perennials and bulbs. The alliums, we have a lot of them, uh, the flowering onions. Um, this is not the, the wild garlic and wild onion that you find coming up in your vegetable garden flower beds and lawn. Those were actually introduced species that are not native here. Um, we have a batch of onions native to a slightly different ecotypes. The, the most common one you see down here on the valley floor is probably the nodding onion, which is the picture you see there with the flower clusters are bent over and hanging upside down. Um, we also see some allium and plectans, um, which is a, usually a little bit higher elevation, drier sites with so good spring moisture. Um, or occasionally, um, uh, allium validum, swamp onion as well. So the things about the uh, alliums of our native alliums, this is not true for alliums worldwide, is they tend to like um, moist sites. They tend to occur in sites that are not completely always flooded, though allium validum likes very wet soils. Um, but soils have kind of consistent moisture through their growing and flowering season. That moisture can go away later in the season when they're dormant. Most alliums will grow, set leaves, and begin their flower bud, and leaves will die back either right at the beginning of flowering or just after flowering as they go dormant. A very typical bulb strategy to cope with, uh, with uh, tough situations like dry summers. Um, again, allium... Uh, Serenium, the nodding onion, is the exception to that case. And in a site that's got decent moisture access or is irrigated, uh, Allium serenium will have leaves through the summer, and in fact, almost year round. All of them are early summer bloomers here, um, and the flowers are reasonably showy and very well loved by pollinators. You can see the, the, smaller, the smaller picture of Allium and plectans is the middle picture there. Showy milkweed is a, is a very highly desired native plant. It is not the easiest plant in the world to get established or to work with when you do have it established because it doesn't play nice. Uh, it's a thug. So it can be difficult to get it established, especially from seed. The best way to handle them is either established plants or better yet from, um, from bare root crowns, from rhizomes, uh, which are typically available now. Um, so showy milkweed likes dry sites. We say that advisedly. It actually likes a little moisture during the beginning of its growing spurt, but it likes to dry down by the time it's getting up to towards flowering ages in the mid to late summer. Um, so you, again, you'll see it on, in ditch lines a lot and similar sites where there's seasonal moisture but not wet year round. Um, it gets two or three feet tall with very large leaves and very showy flowers uh, late into the summer. Um, 
and it is very rhizomatous. It, it will spread and form very thick patches, choking out most other smaller plants around it. It's a huge pollinator plant. It's well known, of course, for its, uh, its role in the life cycle of monarch butterflies. Uh, it's the only, milkweeds are the only food so larval food source for monarchs. Um, different monarchs use different milkweeds. So the, the monarchs that tend to go all the way down to Mexico and come back to the Midwest prefer Asclepias tuberosa, the Midwestern milkweed, which is kind of an orangey flowered thing. Um, our native monarchs tend to winter down more like California and come up the coastline. Um, and they actually prefer our native pink flowered Asclepias speciosus. Um, plant is extremely toxic if ingested. That's why the monarchs use it. Uh, it's what makes them poison them and their caterpillars poisonous to birds and other predators. Besides the butterflies using them both for a pollen nectar, for both for a nectar resource and for a larval resource, bees enjoy milkweed quite a bit. It's got a lot of nectary, so it's a lot to harvest. It has very accessible pollen, and of course, for all, all sorts of bees, pollen is also an important food source. Poorly everlasting. I, I never quite understood why we don't see more of this used as an ornamental, um, because it's hugely adaptable. Uh, it grows in dry locations, and I've seen it growing literally at the sand, sand line at the beach, and I've seen it growing literally at 9,000 feet in the mountains. Uh, it occurs across a tremendous range of environments. But what they all share in common is relatively dry locations in basically full sun or a very little bit of shade. Um, pearly everlasting blooms quite late in the season, uh, typically starting sometime in August. It does bloom clear into the fall, and it's a good pollinator plant, but it's worth noting that the early part of its bloom uh, is actually flowers open. There is nectary, there is pollen available, and, and, and various uh, pollinating insects will forage on it. When you get later in bloom, and they're still throwing a little bit of, they're still showing a little bit of flower right now, those are now dried flowers. They look the same, the color didn't change, they're still that nice white, but there's no longer a nectary or pollen reserve this late into them, so there's no food source, but they're still valuable. So it's nice to have a perennial that blooms for two, two and a half months in the later part of the season and clear into October, uh, making them well worthwhile. They don't really colonize themselves by root system spread. They do set a fairly substantial amount of seed and they will spread themselves from seed into just about any adjacent spot that suits their environmental needs. So you will have to police them a little bit. The Western Columbine is one of those iconic native flowers, um, typically growing in dry or slightly moist environments in sun or partial shade. You will see them growing shadier and flowering shadier uh, than partial, but really, really dense shade is not their, their preferred environment. They're typically a spring to early summer bloomer, making them a, roughly a May flower here uh, in the valley. Uh, and you'll find them a lot in open meadows and edges of woodland. Um, so you think of columbine and what you think of when you, you hear the columbine is what you see there, that nice little inside out flower with the, with the, with the, the, the stamens pushed forward and the petals recurve back, a very distinctive flower. You won't mistake it for anything else. Um, what you don't, think about is our native is a bit different from the hybrids. And what you see is not one flower like that in our native. What you see is a it's kind of ram rambling, uh, loose open perennial about two feet by two feet that might have a hundred flowers like that, but they're smaller than your, than your hybrid uh, columbines you typically see in the garden centers. Still quite showy. Besides uh, the, the Formosa, which is the one that occurs here in the Valley and Coast Range, um, we also have a very pretty yellow columbine at higher elevations in the Cascades and the Wallowas. Um, Brodea, I'm gonna kind of cover a batch of plants under a group there. I learned them all as Brodea back in the day. They have since been separated out into Brodea and Tritelia and um, Diclostemma and a couple other genera. Um, they're broadly called the harvest lilies. Um, they are a, like camas was, they are a significant food source for the indigenous peoples, uh, quite edible. Um, however, the bulbs are tiny, so it takes a lot of them to make it worth the while. Um, because we're taking them as a group, we're going to kind of do some summary on them. Generally speaking, they like to, they, they're quite happy with being dried down in the summer. They go fully summer dormant. In fact, most of them have their foliage already dormant by the time the flower opens. You'll have this, this flower spike, spike up with one or more flowers on it, and all you'll see attached to it are these little withered brown grassy-like leaves. Um, they're very well adapted to their environments. Uh, Brodea elegans is kind of the wettest 
uh, tolerant of the batch. It will be Bridia elegans and Bridia coronaria both. Um, they will occur into really wetland environments, e emergent sites where they're briefly underwater or vernal pool situations, uh, but then dry down in the summer. They don't grow in constantly flooded swamps. Uh, on the other end of that, uh, Diclostema, which is that bottom uh, bluish flower cluster there, um, it typically occurs in drier elevations. It's what you'll see up outside of um, like sulfur springs and, and up in that area as you're starting to get into the foothills of the coast range on the hillsides. Um, Tritelia in the, in the left-hand picture there, um, a clustered flower, typically very showy. Picture shows white in practice when you see them in the wild. They typically have a faint tinge or sometimes more than a faint tinge of blue to them. They're all relatively small, so you want to plant a fairly substantial amount of them if you're looking for a show. Um, the good news is they do that on their own. You put a few bulbs in and they slowly multiply out, forming a patch over time. These are great to be incorporated with some, uh, some ground covers um, to do as a lawn substitute, or even in lawns, as long as you don't mow during their flower and seed set periods, so they have a chance to, to uh, reproduce. Yarrow is uh, native here and, in fact, is native over a whole batch of the northern part of the, of the world. Uh, Achillea millifolium is our native yarrow. Um, it is used in the hybridization of, of, of a lot of the cultivated varieties. Um, typically, what you see for our native is what you see in the picture here, a white flowered yarrow. In the wild, you might find a stand of white that has occasional plants that are showing a bit of yellow or a bit of pinkish purple or other minor color variations. That's just normal genetic variation, but the dominant color is white. They grow in dry environments in sun or partial shade. They're more shade tolerant than they are wet tolerant, um, and they will tolerate quite dry sites once they're well established. They bloom for a very long period of time, starting in early summer and continuing up through the end of August or first part of September major, major pollinator plant. You can tell when you're, if you raise bees, you can tell when your bees are on yarrow late in the summer because all of their, um, their, their pollen packs on their back legs will be uh, gray from the, from the yarrow pollen. It's very distinctive color. Uh, they do colonize once they're established. Yarrow can easily be planted from individual starts of transplants. Um, it's also quite easy to start from seed and is sometimes used as a lawn substitute uh, planted from seed. The, the pussy ears or mariposa or butterfly lily, um, calicortis. Um, so calicortis is an interesting group. The calicortis are all native to the western U.S. Um, the northernmost extent is somewhere up in Washington. They occur all the way through California. Um, there are many different species. Uh, here in our immediate area, we have calicortis tolmii, and that's the picture you see in the inset there. Um, calicortis are all dry climate plants and dry environment plants. They'll grow in sun, they'll grow in shade, they'll grow in anything in between, but they like sh pretty sharp drainage. On the other hand, they need to have some access to some moisture during their immediate growing and blooming period, so not completely bare rock. Um, we will see mariposas, uh, a different species growing in, in alpine environments uh, on scree where there's got a little bit of soil retention intermixed with, uh, with things like mules here. Relatively small plants, 10 or 12 feet. If you plant them, it's going to take them several years before you have more than just one or two flowers out of a planting. It takes a good amount of time for them to mature and, and kind of self-propagate out. Uh, planted usually from a bulb rather than transplant, though can be done both ways. Camas is also iconic for the Willamette Valley as one of the classic uh, Western plants. There's actually two major species here. We have Camassia quamash, the common camas, and Camassia lake linii, the greater camas. Despite the common and greater name, they're about the same size, about the same flower size, about the same color. They're actually relatively difficult to distinguish uh, unless you know exactly what to look for in petal layout uh, in the wild. So uh, you can pretty much incorporate them. Generally speaking, uh, common camas is a little more shade tolerant um, and typically a little smaller. Greater camas is typically, uh, you'll find it in very wet environments only, uh, and is typically a little larger, though that is certainly by no means indicative for identification, definitive for identif identification. Camas blooms in the spring, usually planted from bulbs, can be easily planted from transplants instead if you want to buy one already in bloom to see what you're getting. They're, they handle very well. 
They like sites that are quite wet, though, as I mentioned, Quamash will, Quamash will tolerate some drier environments, and in sun or in quite a bit of shade. Um, they are well visited by a number of pollinators uh, and just a classic plant. You can't miss them um, when you're driving around uh, around Corvallis in the in the spring and uh, around April. Um, you'll see these open meadows that, that are not being tilled or cultivated, and they'll just be turning a solid blue uh, underneath all the camas flowers. Darmera peltata, uh, the umbrella plant, um, is an interesting case. Um, Benton County, Oregon is its northern extent in the wild. It typically grows in partial shade, or I've seen it in the, in the Cascades, it's shadier than partial shade. Um, it does fine in sun as long as it's got consistent water supply. It is a really wetland plant. Um, it does not tolerate drying out well. Typically flowers are born just about the time, or an opening just about the time the foliage is emerging below them, so they're quite a, a standout. Um, you can see the, the inset picture on top uh, shows the flower spikes with no, with no foliage up. Those flower spikes are about three feet in the air to give you a sense of scale. So quite, quite dramatic in bloom. Bloom is brief. After the flower spikes begin to die back, the foliage is, is almost reaching their height, also three to four feet. Um, and so the main picture there shows the, the, the leaf mass at three to four feet. So those individual leaves are a foot or more across, quite a showy leafed plant. Um, we use them a lot as stream bed or in the water pond plants, but they thrive in a well irrigated garden as well. They do colonize, they're, they're like an iris, they've got a big coarse rhizome that spreads right at or right below the, the soil surface and they sprout up from that. They're not hard to control, they're not by any means invasive, but they're not going to just stay as a little tidy plant, they need some space to expand. I love fawn lilies, the erythroniums. They are sometimes a little finicky to get established. Um, they like sites that have plenty of moisture during the winter and spring, um, not flooded, not underwater, but plenty of moisture. But when they go dormant in the summer, they need to be unirrigated. You will kill your erythronium bulbs if you, if you persist in irrigating spots where they are planted. Beyond that, they will tolerate reasonable amounts of sun. I would not put them in the very hottest locations. They do quite well in partial or even full shade. These are an excellent plant to combine with ground covers around things like our native oaks. Um, native oaks are a beautiful thing to have in your landscape, uh, Oregon white oak. But Oregon white oak um, detests consistent irrigation. Its crown and roots need to dry out over the summer or they develop root rot diseases. So it always frustrates and infuriates me to see developments go in into oak woodland. They lose some trees in development. They lose a few more trees from root damage at the course of development over the course of the next few years. And then they lose most of the native oaks because they put lawns in under them and the homeowners want to irrigate that lawn to keep it green and that kills those oak trees. So, this is a good plant to use in those types of sites along with things like yarrow or some of our native bunch grasses to create a lawn-like situation that doesn't need irrigation. Uh, the picture you see here uh, is, is, our, is our local native. Um, and then bear, uh, bear in mind, there's also a pink, this is Erythronium oregonum. There's also a pink uh, form that is native on the Oregon coast, Erythronium revolutum. We'll talk about ferns. I could spend a lot of time just on ferns, so we're going to just deal with ferns as a group. Um, they typically are moist to wet soil environments, but your mileage may vary depending on the fern you play with. We do have cliff breaks and other things that occur in scree environments in the mountains that are not necessarily super, super wet soil plants. Our native western sword fern is another one. While it likes moisture just fine, um, it actually is well adapted to, to getting reasonably dried out in the summer, though not baking hot and dry at the same time. Almost all of our native ferns prefer shade. Some are more or less tolerant to sun. And again, Western sword fern is, is one of the champions for sun adaptability as long as it's getting some moisture. The other end of that scale, the maidenhair fern is the other picture there. Uh, a glorious fern, uh, looks delicate, but it looks less delicate when you see them at almost three feet tall and typically occurs directly in stream courses. Um, so it needs a fairly consistent moisture level and definitely needs shade, it fries in full sun. Uh, lots, of, lots of fun ones to play with. Generally, most of our native ferns are deciduous or herbaceous. They die back to the ground. Um, Western sword fern is fully evergreen. Deer fern, Blechnus picant, is also more or less evergreen depending on just how cold we really get. 
I love fritillaries. It's a stretch to include them in native. Fritillaria finis mostly doesn't make it quite this far north. You see a lot of it in the rogue and sporadically in, in, the, in the coast range. Uh, fritillaries like a dry location in full sun or partial shade. They don't really attain good flowering in darker shade, though they survive it. Um, a, a relatively small plant, again, it takes a fair amount of them to make any show. Um, the flowers, though, are stunning with that checker block pattern. Uh, their common name for them is checker lilies, that checker plant pattern on the inside of the flower. Um, major pollinator plant um, as, as well. Uh, nice plant, a little difficult to establish, and don't summer irrigate them. They, they resent it. The Oregon geranium, wild, Oregon wild geranium, geranium oregonum, um, I understand why it doesn't get more use. I just wish it would get more use. It is one of those native plants you can put in almost any site that is, does not actually winter flood and it will be happy. The reason you don't see more of these and other similar wild geraniums from other regions in landscapes um, around here is because we have a number of weeds, introduced weeds that are also wild geraniums, uh, most notably stinky bob. Um, and people see the leaves coming up in the spring and they spray them out or they grub them out uh, without realizing it's a very nice ornamental if you'd let it establish because it's really hard to tell the different types of geranium apart when they're first emerging in the spring. So an herbaceous perennial, one of the larger wild geraniums, easily two feet tall, um, they don't tend to spread too aggressively, though they are, they have a fairly decent horizontal expanse as an individual plant, they just don't take over. The flowers are, bo are born in typically May here, and it will grow dry sites, moist sites, irrigated sites, unirrigated sites, sun, full shade, or anything in between. Um, so a very adaptable plant and quite a, quite a nice uh, ornamental. would really like to see more use of our native grasses in landscapes. They are critical habitat for a variety of uh, birds and mammals, but also for a variety of butterflies. Uh, so probably we don't think of grasses as normally pollinator plants, but we have a number of moths and butterflies that utilize grasses as a larval food source. Um, two particularly notable grasses for our immediate region. Uh, Discampsia cispitosa is what you see a lot of down here in the valley on the floor. Uh, semi-wetland environments uh, and, and uh, very, very, very widely spread. Um, kind of a tufty uh, bunch grass with the, flower, with the flower spikes being fairly tall, three or maybe even four feet above the foliage. Um, does tend to self-sow prolifically uh, and is best either cut back or burned out um, in, the, in the late summer to fall to, to maintain it. Uh, Romer's fescue is our immediate local version of the Idaho fescue. Uh, looks a lot like the, uh, the European blue fescue that is widely used in landscaping. Not quite as blue, not quite as tidy. The flower spikes are a little more prolific and a little taller. Um, good bunch grass for sunnier sites. Um, both of these will tolerate reasonable amounts of moisture uh, during the winter, but not typically underwater environments. There's a lot of other woodland grasses you can play with, and um, while these Descampsia and Festuca are often available as plants to transplant throughout the year, a lot of our other native grasses are often available in seed mixes mixed with uh, reseeding native annuals or native perennials um, that you can seed like an oak savanna mix or an upland prairie mix or a diverse prairie mix or a tenacious site mix for, for some of the tough, uh, tough environments. Um, so a good way to handle and experiment a little bit with the native grasses is to seed them in, in conjunction with other native plants in a small area. Lupins. So the thing about lupins is that our lupins are not like everybody else's lupins. Uh, most lupins from a lot of other re regions are seasonally wet, but relatively dry most of the year plants. You see them on alpine ridges where there's brief moisture and nothing else. Um, ours are wetland plants for the most part. Uh, Lupinus polyphyllus, uh, one of the big ones out here. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of those, and when I say big, four or five feet, uh, truly a, a substantial perennial. Uh, typically growing in sun or partial shade in seasonal wetlands or similar constantly moist environments. They bloom early to midsummer. Uh, flowers are usually blue or white or some admixture thereof, though you will get occasional random uh, individual plants with different colored flowers out of any given population. Huge wildlife plant, um, flowers 
leaves and seeds, particularly seeds, are poisonous, so do not eat them. Um, that, don't graze them with your livestock. Um, we have a, a batch of them. I like some of the smaller ones, but most of the smaller ones really aren't our regional natives. They're typically from other, uh, other areas. We have two major species of iris in our zone, a couple others that occur sporadically. Um, they are nice, uh, adaptable plants, very tough. Usually our irises are not handled from bulbs because we don't have bulb type irises. We have fibrous rooted irises for the most part. Uh, Iris 10X is uh, probably the classic example. A relatively narrow, that's what you see in the picture there, relatively narrow uh, grassy foliage. Um, flowers are uh, March or April and uh, pretty, pretty pronounced. The classic uh, expression of our native irises are the purple tones. Any given population you see of iris uh, will have the occasional yellow or white uh, member as well, so they can be diverse. Um, typically moist or wet sites, not super, super dry sites for our irises. They prefer sun, they will do fine in partial shade. They can adapt to fair amounts of shade, they won't bloom well as they get too dark. Uh, Mimulus gattatus is the uh, yellow monkey flower, and uh, it's again a hugely diverse uh, location plant. It's a plant you see on the coast, you see down here on the valley floor in wetland environments. Um, you'll also find it at nine and 10,000 feet in the mountains along stream courses, and it's the same species, Mimulus gattatus. Um, a fairly um, spreading plant, a good colonizer, uh, with a very nice, relatively brief bloom early in the spring, March, April. Yellow flowers are very pronounced. You'll find it growing typically as a low spreader, occasionally where there's a little more soil to grab a hold of. A lot of the sites it grows in are somewhat sandy or gravelly. Um, you'll find taller arms coming up, maybe a foot or a foot and a half tall. Um, sun or partial shade, it looks delicate, but it actually prefers a, a sunnier location rather than a shadier location. We have another uh, really showy mimulus, but again, not quite into our region. Uh, there's a really pretty tall, tall pink mimulus from, the, from the, both the Cascades and, and Points East, uh, river, river, Riverside Plains. A few others that care from time to time. Like with lupins, penstemons, we'll put the common name in for the slide, beard tongue. Nobody calls them beard tongues out here. Everybody calls them penstemon. Um, our penstemons are somewhat different from a lot of the penstemons mm -hmm. you'll find in other regions of the world. Our penstemons tend to be bluish colored to, or to light purple colored. Our penstemons tend to be wetland plants, not dry rockery plants. So typically moist to wet environments in sun or mostly sun, partial shade is acceptable. Um, you find them commonly growing out here in the wet prairies um, and uh, a very, very nice showy plant. Great uh, pollinator plant. We have, uh, we have several species of bees that are penstemon specialists. That's, that's what they are focused on, on foraging on. Blue-eyed grass, uh, I find blue-eyed grass cropping up sporadically in my yard anyway. I'm on kind of wetland soils out northeast Corvallis. And every few years, I'll get a, a little patch of them that persists for a year or two before it peters out um, and without even introducing them, just part of the natural botany out there. Uh, they do like wetland environments and they will tolerate partial flooding or, or quite, quite, se quite substantial seasonal wetness. They like full sun, they'll tolerate a little bit of shade. They're a relatively small plant, um, but can be planted to form a, a, a thicket or, or carpet, uh, almost a ground cover effect. They will tolerate quite a bit of moisture. So they don't like deep flooding where it gets clear up over the tops, deep, you know, foot or more of water, but they're perfectly at home in a, in a year round swamp where the water is not too deep or on the edges of a, a larger body of water in the margins. Oregon saxifrage, um, a plant that you is all over the place out here on the valley floor and you probably never see it because it's all over the place in these wet prairies and it's in bloom while the prairies are still so wet you're not out on them, a very, very wetland plant. Um, so flower spikes are 12 to 15 to maybe 18 inches, usually um, very pale pink fading white. Um, quite a good show when they're massed together. Uh, by the time the prairie is wet enough to walk on, the flowers are beginning to die down, and all you have is this basal rosette of these green oblong leaves, which is not really readily distinguished from the surrounding flora. Um, so 
quite wet environments, um, also a good um, pond plant or streamside plant. They do colonize and create um, fairly substantial colonies over time uh, from the root system spread and also from reseeding. Checker mallows. Uh, we have three major ones here in the valley. Um, Sedalsia campestris is the picture you see there, and it's the latest bloomer, usually um, like late June, early July here. Um, typically a little drier than other checker mallows. So we find this up in the partial shade uh, as we're getting upslope away from the stream banks for the most part. Our other checker mallows, uh, we have uh, um, um, Sedalsia cusicii, uh, Cusix checker mallow, and Sedalsia vergata, uh, ro rose checker mallow. Uh, those are much more wetland plants growing in truly vernal pool or emergent wetland, things that are actually underwater in the winter and then dry out in the summer. Um, as is typical of plants from that environment, they bloom in the spring, they set seed, they go dormant if, they, if, the, if the moisture goes away in the summer, but come back the next year. They're actually quite hardy. Some of our more mm -hmm. showy uh, wildflowers, three feet of flower spike uh, is not at all unheard of and sometimes a bit taller. Lots of flowers per spike blooming over a several week period, uh, major pollinator plant. Uh, so an excellent choice for landscaping and particularly um, intermixing into an irrigated landscape where the moisture is consistent. Um, the checker mallows like Cusicii and Vergata, when we grow them in, in swamps or in ponds or, or stream banks, um, continue to have foliage and continue to rebloom sporadically through the entire summer. That doesn't normally happen in the wild because they're outcompeted in those sites with more aggressive plants in sites where that doesn't keep quite as much moisture, they simply go dormant. Fall Solomon seal. Um, okay, so I still have it in his Simulacima racemosa. I know, I know, if you, if you keep up on such things, they, they moved that whole genus back into Meanthemum. So even the Latin changes makes it hard to keep up from time to time. Um, so fall Solomon seal has a couple of particular distinctions. Um, it's actually one of the plants that is the most widely visited by different types of pollinators. Uh, it's a partial to full shade plant, usually getting about two to maybe three feet tall with flowers uh, in the late spring and berries in the early to mid or sometimes late summer, depending on elevation. It does colonize and spread itself fairly effectively in any spot where it has both reasonable shade and reasonable moisture. The berries are super tasty. Uh, you learn quickly if you, if, you, if you spend any time out in the woods not to eat the red berries, but this is an exception. A red berry plant that has really flavorful berries that are much eaten by deer and various rodents as well and, and birds. Um, so a really good, uh, easy to grow, shade plant for wetter shade locations. There's a, there's a, a dwarf cousin, um, Mantum dilatatum, uh, which has a little heart-shaped leaf instead of this big composite leaf. The plant never gets more than about six or seven inches tall, also makes a great ground cover for slightly drier shade environments, though not super dry. Also has a wonderful tasting edible berry much later in the season, usually fall, tastes like cranberries, very distinctive. Okay, I put trilliums in because it is such a classic Northwest plant. To be honest, trilliums are very difficult to handle successfully. They're not easy to plant. They're not easy to transplant. You should be, put them in places where they don't get disturbed because they resent disturbance. And then once you plant them, you might not see any flowers for three to four to five years. Uh, so they're kind of a pain to work with, but they're such a Northwest classic that they're hard not to incorporate. Um, there are, we have three major species and a whole batch of other minor ones in specific locations. They have some things in common. They're shade plants. They all like shade to partial shade. They do not tolerate very much intense sun. Most of them prefer moist to wet. A few of them, Trillium ovatum in particular, will creep up into drier environments. None of them thrive in really, really dry environments though. Um, spring blooms with a classic three petal structure and then beneath that uh, this flower stalk there will be three uh, bract like leaves uh, around the stem. They separate them not usually by flower color because they vary not only from plant to plant within the species but also individual flowers over time. They might start out white and age to a very deep rich violet purple um, or they might start out purple and age pinkish green. <laughs> So what they usually differentiate them on is, is differentiate them on is the tepal development and how far the flower cluster is born above the leaves. So 
They'll either be STEMI trilliums or sessile or stemless uh, trilliums. We have a batch of violets throughout, throughout Oregon, um, two that are pretty common within our range. Viola adunca is the blue flowered uh, stream side violet. Viola glabra, the yellow violet you see all over the place here on the valley floor. They like moist to wet environments in partial to full shape. They do spread fairly aggressively once established, not as bad as some of the weedy wild violets from other regions, but they will definitely make a ground cover. But they're very small, usually three or four inches tall or so. Um, brief uh, flower period in the spring is, is, is well loved and the foliage with its kind of attractive heart shape for most species is, uh, is, is desirable in its own right. Will go summer dormant in drier environments and come back until you get so dry that they just don't come back anymore. And we are out of time. So I just wanted to take a moment to uh, open up and ask if you have any other questions for me. All right. Well, I thank you all for attending. Appreciate it. And uh, go forward and plant some natives. You don't have to be a plant geek or put in these native, specifically native habitats to enjoy native plants in your home landscape. Thank you very much.